Hi there, welcome back. This is Professor Schimmeld with, I think it's part four of the lecture on um, virology. What I want to do in this segment is finish my coverage of the herpes viridae or herpes virus family. And we're going to pick up the discussion with the uh, varicella zoster virus and you can follow along on your outline and take really good notes, you guys. Um, all right, now this is a virus that causes both chicken pox and shingles. Um, and there was a vaccine introduced into general use in 1995, I think it was 95, um, to vaccinate uh, children against chicken pox. And um, I have to say that the year before that happened, I um, incorrectly predicted that the vaccine wasn't going to be released into general use, at least not for a while. And the reason I, um, I thought that was because as vaccines go, this was a relatively new one. What I mean is, is that uh, like, for example, polio vaccine, um, we have decades of history with the polio vaccine. We have a, a clear idea of um, how long it provides immunity, what percentage of those that receive the vaccine are going to be immune, side effects, that sort of thing. And as I mentioned before, the chickenpox vaccine was a relatively new one. And so the concern was this. Um, now, chickenpox, when it occurs in children, is usually a mild uh, childhood disease. There are definitely exceptions to that. Children can die from chickenpox, but that's just not common. But if an adult who's never been exposed, obviously, does acquire the disease, there is a significant mortality rate in that adult. So the concern with the vaccine was this. Let's say we vaccinated children at two years of age and the vaccine was effective for 20 years. Uh, so then we would have a 22 year old individual that was susceptible to the virus and, you know, could uh, actually die from the infection. Uh, well, anyways, they did, they being public health officials, released the vaccine into general use. And what they said was, is that um, even if the vaccine didn't provide lifelong immunity, that the adult would get a mild case of the disease, similar to what they would have um, had if they were um, um, infected as a child. And so I thought, okay, um, why not just let kids go ahead and get this and get, get it over with? And as a matter of fact, I don't know if this still happens, but it used to be... Um, fashionable to have what were called chicken pox parties. And what that means is, is that if um, uh, parents knew that somebody's child in the neighborhood had chicken pox, they would invite their child over to play with them, become infected, get the disease and get it over with. Now, I'm not saying that's a smart thing to do, but uh, you know, like I said, it was so rare for um, any serious um, complications from chicken pox in children that people just kind of wanted to get it over with with their kids. Um, but uh, like I said, um, this was the situation and I still, um, you know, just kind of didn't get it until sometime later when the shingles vaccine was introduced. But let me talk about chicken pox first and then I'll come back and talk about shingles and the shingles vaccine and I'll try to kind of tie those things together. All right, so taking a look at your outline, um, it says there adult infections are more serious, have a significant mortality rate. There are some notes about possible complications. Um, there is a, um, a photo in your outline of um, typical chicken pox blisters. Now let's talk about um, um, incubation, transmission incubation, and um, possible complications. Now the virus is acquired through the respiratory route, and that could be through inhalation of viral particles in um, respiratory secretions like cough or sneeze produced droplets or touching the blisters and then um, inhaling particles, but respiratory route, two week incubation period, um, and the patient is going to become contagious maybe one to two days before the rash begins until all of the blisters have scabbed over. And by the way, they could have anywhere from um, 250 to five blisters or less than that. I'll, I'll get back to you in a second on that. Um, just comparing my notes here with you. All right, um, so those fluid filled blisters, like I said, could be anywhere from 250 to 500 of them, or in some cases, because some people say, um, no, I've never had chicken pox, <coughs> excuse me, but some cases may be so mild as to largely go unnoticed, like maybe the child has a mild case and there are just a few pox, like say in the scalp, and they go unnoticed, so they may actually, um, uh, have been infected and just aren't aware of it. And so that person, just like anybody else that's infected with the virus, could potentially develop shingles at, um, at a later date. Uh, but still talking about 
chicken pox. Now that rash, usually we see it um, on, the, um, on the trunk of the body, the extremities, but it can occur in the oral cavity and in the eyes, and that just sounds um, pretty super miserable, right? And once the infection, um, or I should say once the symptoms have resolved, the virus is going to remain latent in those nerve cells for the rest of the patient's life. So you, uh, this is a, a latent and a persistent infection. So once you're infected with one or any of the herpes viruses or more, you will be infected for life and you may or may not have um, outbreaks in the future. Um, as far as treatment goes, um, calamine lotion or um, um, oatmeal bath products can help with the itching and non-aspirin products for uh, reduction of the fever. Uh, oh, here's a note. About one in three individuals in the United States will have at least one outbreak of shingles. I've had two. Uh, and there are about one million cases of shingles a year in the United States. So let's go on and talk about shingles. All right, caused by the same virus. Okay, so you have chicken pox. Um, and by the way, this shingles thing, um, I'm sure there are exceptions, there are exceptions to everything, but if you um, have been vaccinated against chicken pox and so you never acquired the virus, right, um, then you can't develop shingles. Shingles is the result of reactivation of the virus, and that can occur through um, physical or emotional stress, physical meaning um, you, maybe you're sick with something else so your immunity is lowered, um, emotional stress. This used to be a disease that was almost exclusively seen in the elderly. And um, when they were, um, when elderly folks were in impoverished situations, it was very common for them to have outbreaks of shingles. Um, all right, so let me just catch up with your outline to see what you've got. Not a lot, so you best uh, take notes here. But there is a photo showing, um, it's not a great photo, but showing the rash that we might see um, with shingles. Um, all right, I talked about reactivation. Begins with um, itching, numbness at the at the affected site, um, tingling uh, sensation, and um, severe pain. Uh, and the rash is a bit different than the one that we saw with chickenpox. Um, rather than just a generalized rash that can occur in any part of the body, the shingles rash is different in these ways. One, there are fluid-filled blisters and they are contagious. Someone who has not been vaccinated for chickenpox or has not been exposed, if they come into contact with somebody with an active case of shingles, they will develop chickenpox. But anyways, um, so uh, we've got um, the symptoms showing the, uh, the beginning of the um, uh, outbreak of shingles and the rash begins to develop smaller blisters. But the pattern of the blisters is rather interesting because the virus um, is in those nerve cells. You, you may see the rash on one side of the body and not at all on the other. You may see it follow nerve pathways, all right? So those are just some clues that other than you know the excruciating pain that we're dealing with shingles. Now this can result in persistent weeks to months to even permanent nerve damage. Uh, the pain could uh, potentially last for weeks or months or forever. And um, like I said, used to be seen almost exclusively in elderly individuals, but now it's seen in all age groups. Now more than half of the cases of shingles are seen in individuals 60 years of age or older. So that means half of them are seen in, in younger individuals. Um, this can be very serious in people that have um, severe immune deficiencies. And in about, I think it was 2006, the shingles vaccine was introduced. And I, I think you'll agree there was a big um, um, public health campaign you saw, and still do, all kinds of commercials about people that have had shingles advocating that you, um, that you take the vaccine. And, um, and finally, the light bulb went on for me. Okay, so this was really a long game that public health officials were, uh, were playing, starting with the chickenpox vaccine. And here's how it works. Uh, we could potentially eradicate this virus from the human population, but if we're going to do so, we need to vaccinate both ends of our society. Here's what I mean. We need to vaccinate children and prevent them 
from ever being infected with the varicella zoster virus. And then um, adults who have, like me, have had chicken pox, vaccinate them for shingles. Now, they're already infected with the virus, right? But what the shingles vaccine is going to do is minimize the chances of someone who's infected with the virus having an outbreak. So that means they are less likely to be contagious to others. Now, uh, if we're all really good about this and we get our children vaccinated and we get a, uh, for chicken pox and adults vaccinated for shingles, we could potentially completely eradicate this virus from our population. And I think that would be a good thing. All right, uh, enough about chicken pox and shingles. Uh, by all means, we can talk about this in class. So if you have any questions or anything you wanna talk about, let me know and we'll do that. All right, so um, one more to finish up the herpes viridae family, and that would be the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV. Um, it's also known as um, human herpes virus 4. And this is the last of the herpes viruses that I'm going to discuss with you guys, but there are others, all right? Um, all right, so this virus is going to infect um, epithelial cells and B cells. Those are uh, one of the types of cells that are in our immune system. And, um, what happens here is that after the initial infection, and I'll talk about symptoms, uh, potential symptoms in just a couple of minutes, the um, immune system will kind of um, uh, get the infection under control, you know, so it's like kind of like a standoff. Um, and um, there is a dormant stage of Epstein-Barr virus that will persist in B cells for the rest of the individual's life. Now, the, the primary disease caused by Epstein-Barr virus is called infectious mononucleosis, or uh, commonly just referred to as mono, or the kissing disease. And that's because this virus is going to be transmitted through saliva of an infected individual. And that could be through kissing or sharing drinking vessels or any other way that people might exchange saliva. Um, anyways, I think I'm forgetting to tell you something. Well, um, let's talk about symptoms. We're going to see um, uh, anywhere from a very mild case of mono to um, a, a pretty severe case of mono. Symptoms can include um, fever, chills, sore throat, swollen glands, and profound fatigue. I mean, so profound that the individual uh, can barely drag themselves out of their bed to go and use the bathroom, for example. And that that fatigue can last anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of months. And there's really no chemotherapy for this except um, extended bed rest. Uh, uh, may give um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, meds to help with the fever. And in some severe cases, um, um, possibly even um, steroids if the inflammation is bad. Uh, an enlarged, dangerously enlarged spleen is a possible complication. So individuals that have an active case of mononucleosis, they, they need to be careful um, not to, you know, I guess you always should to not take a blow to the abdomen because it could possibly rupture the spleen. Now, another interesting thing about this virus is that it, it has been implicated in um, some types of cancer for example, Burkett's lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma and also um, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So when I say implicated, I mean that a high percentage of individuals with uh, those cancers test positive for the virus. Okay, well, let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, I am a two-time survivor of lymphoma and I was first diagnosed in, um, I guess it was late 2009, with um, what they call classic Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, it was um, you know, not fun and uh, required a couple of abdominal surgeries for biopsies and then uh, six months of a very horrible chemo called ABVD. Google it, it was uh, not fun. It's the kind of chemo that makes you vomit you know, every day um, and um, makes you miserable in many other ways, but I'm not complaining because I'm still here and I've been cancer free for several years now. Uh, so anyway, so I was first diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma 
all right that's fine uh, underwent uh, the chemo got through the chemo my scans were clean for about a year and then a scan showed a, another small active area this all occurred my, my um, lymphoma was in deep in my abdomen and um, my doctor said oh it's probably nothing I'm telling you I freaked the only way we could find out what it was was by doing another abdominal surgery to get another um, tissue sample to biopsy well it was lymphoma but it was a different kind it was a type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma called follicular lymphoma well that was a real head scratcher um, and after further examination of my ori original tissue samples it turns out that I really had both kinds originally it's just there was a lot of the Hodgkin and just a little bit of the follicular so they didn't see the follicular in the um, in the tissue sections that they looked at well so when I'm diagnosed with this second lymphoma um, I said to my oncologist um, you know I, I haven't had mono to my knowledge but two lymphomas will you please test me sure as heck I tested positive for Epstein-Barr virus so I'm not saying it's a uh, uh, the virus that caused my lymphomas, but I'm just saying a large percentage of uh, individuals with Burkett's lymphoma, Hodgkin, non-Hodgkin lymphoma do test positive for the virus. So uh, what the virus does is it can transform B cells into cancerous cells, and that may well be what happened with me. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and break now, and then we will pick up um, our survey of DNA viruses when I come back in the fifth section. Thanks for watching, you guys.